as you guys know, this is Dale Dougherty, who's the co-founder of O'Reilly Media and founder of Make Magazine and the Maker Fair. Um, so if you could just give him a round of applause. Good, I, I have to stay near the podium, I gather. Um, how, how many of you are familiar with Make and Maker Fair? Good, uh, that's probably why you're here. Um, you know, I, today I tried to put some context around what I see and what we're doing and also show you a lot of things that uh, we are coming up in Make and, and, and talking a bit about Maker Faire. Um, and I'm going to start with a, a fairly gratuitous video, but it, it actually shows uh, um, a festival in Mexico. It has nothing to do with Make or, or Maker Faire, and I don't think I could do what they're doing at Maker Faire without getting in a huge amount of trouble. And to be said, you probably shouldn't do this at home either. Um, it's called Sledgehammer Fireworks. And um, they tape explosives to the end of a sledgehammer and then hit it on an I-beam. <laughs> it's very much a DIY, get involved, do it yourself uh, thing. And what's kind of interesting in this video, a fella comes up related to the person shooting the video and starts asking questions and they say, hey, do you want to try it? So I'll let you go from there. Possible to turn the lights off over here or is that a little bit bleeding? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Watch how quickly this guy comes up behind him. You know? So uh, it's not something you want to do, I think, but uh, it, it's kind of interesting. Not only the activity is a group of people doing something, but they dress the part and, and do that, which kind of leads me into my, my uh, idea here that I wanted to talk about. Do you know there's 84,000 people registered on the U.S. Census who, who lists a primary occupation as Elvis impersonator? Um, and... Uh, uh, you know, there's something about uh, what I'm calling the rise of tribute bands. Uh, amateurs acting like pros, doing things that are uh, like what someone else does, but doing it at their own level. Um, you know, and, and to some degree, to be able to take uh, an idea, make it your own, and, and uh, perform it in front of people. Here's a, a five-year-old kid um, who dresses up like the drummer from Kiss. And, and, you know, creates a YouTube video and, uh, you know, you probably wouldn't watch him if he wasn't dressed up like uh, Eric Singer. So, um, what is it that's going on here? Um, you know, to some degree there are, there are musicians, there are bands out there, uh, but uh, as in this uh, quote here, he said, you know, let's be Guns N' Roses for Halloween. They went out and said, I got to play someone and... and, and 
be that uh, person that I really admire, but they somehow got a crowd, and it, it mattered to them that they got a, f a group of people in front of them. This is another tribute band, uh, DSO, Dark Star Orchestra. They actually recreate Grateful Dead concerts. They take a particular concert, a particular date, and they play every song that was played by the Grateful Dead on that date. Um, they sell CDs. They s sell everything. I mean, they, they've become their own touring band. And this is my Zeppelin tribute band. Uh, you know, and, and a reporter asked him, do you think the rise in the, in the number of tribute bands means that something's missing from today's music? And he says, yes, you know, it's too corporate. Creativity is gone. Um, I mean, you're basically copying someone and, uh, and saying that uh, creativity is gone. So, but one of the patterns that I'd like to talk about today, in, in many ways, that when you make something, it doesn't have to be your own idea. It doesn't have to be original. It, it, copying is a particular human thing that we do well, and it's a pretty good starting point for many of us. And it often leads to other things. I mean, you could argue that Guitar Hero makes everyone into a tribute band, and you play in your living room. We, we uh, came across this group, Guitar Zeros, who took Guitar Heroes and began playing real music with their play guitars, right? They, they took the, the plastic guitar controls and realized that, you know, it had sensors and you could do different movements with it, and then they plugged it up to their own controller and began to, to create their own music, create their own band, and we put them on the cover of, of uh, Make uh, uh, last year sometime. So as a pattern, these are enthusiasts. Um, they're doing something they love. They're amateurs. That's kind of the root word of the uh, root meaning of the word amateur. Um, but I think what's often lost in this is that they're actually really interested in creating a following. They want to connect to other people. This is something that they, on one hand, do on their own, but they want to connect to other people doing similar things, and they want to share that with other people. Which sort of leads me to this kind of idea about, well, what can we learn from garage bands? What can we learn from that process? Meaning, and I, I'm thinking in terms of education, I'm thinking in terms of innovation. So it's a kind of pattern. Um, a garage band, you, you don't necessarily need formal training in music, say, to play in a garage band. Um, it might help, but it's not required. What's almost more important is your own initiative, that you start something yourself and you're committed to, to working at it. And then uh, pretty soon you begin to find other people who are at your own level of ability or interest and you try to meet with them and you try to get together and, and, and do things. Something that I'm seeing kind of uh, broadly in, in this area, of, and not just garage bands, but you think about it, Today, in many, many different areas, amateurs and professionals are using the same tools. In this case, it's guitars. Um, in, in the case of publishing, uh, I'm probably using the same tools that my audience is using. Um, we're, we're all uh, kind of converging on the same tool set. But behind it, you practice and you play. And that's kind of the, the pattern of making for, for most people. You, you are practicing something to get better at it, but you're also playing, you're enjoying it. And as I said earlier, you realize that at some point it's okay to copy. Um, we probably call it sharing in a, in a more uh, uh, fashionable sense, but we're, we inherently copy each other, um, just as when you watch that sledgehammer fireworks, you start thinking about, well, really, how could I do that? But also, you begin to create a following, and you're interested in that. And, and I think that's, uh, again, what we're beginning to see in makers. What's really different today, say, from the models of a lone tinkerer, is that they, it's easier for them to connect with other people. You are often dependent on, on uh, you know, the people in your neighborhood, the people in your school, to find uh, uh, sort of fellow travelers. Today, I, I think you can reach out and connect to, to lots of different groups. But in, in the garage band model, you're looking for venues. Where can we go to play together? Where can we get friends to come and see us? And how do you develop a following over time? And, and even how you track that? Well, of course, of course, garage bands go back to even, you know, uh, uh, you know, the, the idea or the paradigm, if you will, of garage invention, um, which is obviously well known in the valley here. But one you might not know as well is this is Bagley Avenue. It's the garage of Henry Ford, where in 1896 he built the first, 
his first vehicle, which he called the quadricycle. It was really uh, built from bicycle parts. And, uh, you know, that's what his garage looked like then. Um, but, you know, interestingly enough for Ford, he had a, a kind of similar idea. He wasn't the inventor of automobiles. He was really someone who was trying to create an affordable, reliable, reliable, reliable vehicle that he thought um, more people could use. His real interest was to help get people off of farms and into cities. Uh, he grew up on a farm himself, and he thought that was just uh, a terrible place to have to be all by yourself. He was also afraid of horses and, and didn't like uh, um, farm work, so he wanted to uh, remove some of the drudgery. But, you know, there was also this social component of, of garages. They were places to hang out, or in the case here of the Homebrew Computer Club, which is, again, it's almost mythical in terms of the formation of uh, and, and, and start of computing in the Valley. But um, Steve Wozniak says, I, I just love going to the Homebrew Computer Club, showing off my uh, uh, ideas and designing uh, neat computers. I was willing to do that for free for the rest of my life. And there were things like the West Coast Computer Fair, where uh, early Apple II computers were shown to people, and they had no idea that other people would be interested in what they were doing. Well, today, maybe the equivalent of the Homebrew Computer Club is something called Hackerspaces. Um, this is NYC Resistors, uh, Resistor in, uh, in Brooklyn, and uh, uh, it's probably a couple years old. There's several in the Bay Area. Um, uh, Noise Bridge in San Francisco is one hackerspace. Um, and they're kind of a, a growing movement. And these are, these are a, a group of individuals who get together to rent a space, buy equipment, maintain it, and they pay somewhere between $80 and $100 a month to get together um, and uh, have a space to make things in. But like the, uh, uh, you know, the, the garage bands, this is sort of the, the garage bands of the make world. Um, this is MakerBot is their product, and uh, that's Brie Pettis on, on your left, and, uh, or, no, you're right, sorry. And, um, and uh, you know, they made this, out, started it as a business out of a, a NYC resistor. And, you know, it's, it's essentially along an open source model where uh, there was a project called RepRap, which was trying to do 3D printing. And they took that project and, and really packaged it up, uh, it up in a nice way. They took the, um, uh, the open source, they used an Arduino controller, and they, they kind of just uh, uh, created a polished kit that uh, um, made it affordable for a new, range, new audience of people to have 3D printers. And, you know, this is kind of what it looks like uh, sort of being put together. Uh, you know, you have to build the casing and, and connect all the electronics together. But it's taking something that, um, which, which I'll be talking about today, it's taking something that costs, uh, you know, ten to, uh, let's say fifteen to $20,000 and bringing it down to, you know, $1,000 or less as, as a kit model. It kind of is reminiscent of those of you who might remember laser printers and things of how they started off very expensive in the almost $30,000 range and then began uh, finding a broader audience and came down dramatically in price. So one aspect is, is there's a community behind the MakerBot and they're producing drawings and things that you can use on the MakerBot to create um, uh, uh, create objects. And, and so you could go the, to this site called Thingiverse, download uh, uh, um, the graphic, and, and play with it, modify it, or just send it right out to the printer. This is a part, and it's assembled. Uh, someone's making a, a, a model of a cathedral, a Gothic cathedral, and uh, they're printing out all the individual parts and then assembling it like that. So uh, a, a really kind of interesting uh, application. So the it's not only the tool, but the tool also creates a community of users who share designs and uh, expertise. Um, we're not Rolling Stone, but you know these guys did get on the cover of, of Make um, with their MakerBot and the current issue, and um, we're really talking a lot about 3D printing and, and CNC machines in, in that. So uh, kind of relating to the tribute bands is sort of, I, I think one of the opportunities in making is this idea of doing knockoffs. And we sometimes 
say that fairly negatively and we say that China does a knockoff of American products and things, but maybe we need to do our own knockoffs. And we certainly see that in the DIY world. Um, again, uh, taking something that's an industrial 3D printer, looking at the technology, how with, with various components can I make a um, $1,000 version of that? Um, some of these things are, are, are rather fanciful and, and different. This is uh, something coming to Maker Faire called Hermes. Uh, it's someone built a space shuttle for themselves. Um, they intend it to fly someday, but uh, right now it's kind of connected to their garage in, in Arizona. Um, but uh, again, it's, it's, you know, if you remember some, Make is, is sort of based on some of the old magazines like Popular Science and Popular Mechanics. And, you know, if you go back and look at those old covers, often it was, you know, build your own space vehicle in the 50s. It was that sort of level of fantasy. The, in fact, they, they say the most popular cover is the sort of the car, uh, the, the car that converts to a plane. And every now and then they'll, they'll, they'll it's never been solved in a useful way, but uh, everybody believes it's around the corner. Um, here's an example of, of a group called Backyard Brains. They're out of uh, a PhD uh, 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 graduates from uh, Miss Michigan in neuroscience. And this is a, a device they call the spiker box. And uh, they're trying to measure the flow of neurons in, in, a, um, in an insect's leg. And, and all it does is produce a sound uh, of that flow, and they can, they can strike it and do different things. But what was interesting there is these guys said that it was the third year of grad school before they got access to the device to, to hear this, to plant the electrodes in the insect's leg and listen to it. And that device cost about $40,000. Well, their spiker box is about a $100 kit. And their idea is, is well, suddenly that device could be out in, the, in, in a high school biology classroom, and you could do this experiment. Um, you can kind of hear a little bit of it there. Um, uh, it, it could be broadened in its use to a, a, a larger audience. Um, you know, they said, think about what if telescopes were only available at observatories? You know, what does it mean to have a telescope that's affordable and in your backyard? So I think there's areas of knockoffs like this in scientific instrumentation and, and other uh, perhaps industrial equipment that uh, we might be seeing from makers, either to make something more affordable, to... Uh, to realize that there are now open components such as microcontrollers that could be used in, in making that thing and that a community can, can help put it together. Um, and finally, that the use could be extended to a broader audience. This is kind of, in, in some ways, an idea that's related to Eric uh, von Hippel's book in Democratizing Innovation. And his idea is, is a lot of product innovation comes from user communities. Uh, not just from an R&D process, which is what our, our, our more conventional model is, and that users are able to innovate themselves, that they don't have to develop everything they need. In fact, um, being able to borrow and put together things that other people have done is, is pretty much a maker skill. But his, I think the most important point is that users benefit directly from their own innovations. And he gives a lot of examples from extreme sports uh, where someone uh, uh, wants to modify a kayak to go down a certain kind of rapids and they need a snub-nosed kayak. And the manufacturers don't make that. They don't believe there's an audience for that. So someone begins to make that. Other people see him. And, uh, you know, it's, it's often the start of a small business. We had a young maker program in San Francisco, the Exploratorium, and one of our young, uh, he's a junior at Mountain View, and he, he's a professional skateboarder downhill. Um, and he, he is modifying, he, he's never had to make something like this before, but he's modifying the trucks of his skateboard because he wants a different kind of feel on, on such a, a fast ride. And uh, so it's a kind of a similar thing where he's at the edge of, of performance of, of what standard equipment would offer and he wants to extend it. Um, these are all Model Ts that have been modified in the field for different purposes. And, you know, it, it sort of tells you that hacking has been going on for a long time, um, that we modify the things we use, we change them because we see opportunities to use them in ways that they're not intended. And this is an example from Monkey Bikes, and these are LED wheels, which uh, 
you know, we, we can put on a bike, and it might, you might use it for just sort of form of expression, but it also sort of serves as a, as a safety uh, device as well. Uh, but again, modifying something fairly simple. So in many ways, what I see in the make spaces and, and from the beginning is people are playing with technology, the way we play with music or we play in other areas. And out of that sparks new ideas and sparks uh, uh, sort of new opportunities to meet other people. Communities organize around projects and tools and skill sets. Um, I mentioned Arduino, and it's becoming you know, this really important thing that, that, there, that a lot of people are learning electronics to be able to create specialized devices. I, I was meeting with someone yesterday who's at Stanford working on, a, um, on an artificial knee, the Jiper knee. And, uh, you know, they, they're really fascinated by what cheap microcontrollers can allow them to do in areas that uh, um, they might not have had. And, again, part of the, uh, um, the design goal around something like Jiper Knee was to make it affordable in a, in a very um, uh, 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 different market. Um, we also have artists collaborating and creating new forms of expression. Um, this is a... Um, a pulse jet organ, um, which not only makes terrific sound, um, it shoots flame in the air. And I just like the idea of the keyboard there <laughs> um, connected to something that complicated. What's pretty cool, too, it also folds up into a little car and like something from Star Wars rolls away after a performance. Um, we also form communities in workshops and with hand tools and the other kinds of things that we have uh, I at hand. Um, but one of the things that I'm particularly interested in, and this is kind of the heart and soul of MAKE, is that instructions um, are patterns, um, patterns for other people to follow. And, and sharing those instructions is pretty powerful. Instructions are the open source of making. It is our code base. It's here's how I did this. And it might be someone's particular way of doing it. It might be more like a general recipe for doing a class of things. But essentially, uh, when I saw, uh, came up with the idea for Make, I saw that technology magazines really didn't contain those kind of instructions anymore. They talked about technology, but they didn't really say how they were put together or how you might do this yourself. So by having those instructions, you allow someone to, to respond by saying, I, I'd like to build that. I'd like to learn how to do that. Um, in many ways, the, the, our very first issue, uh, I, I often use this because uh, this was a, a sort of a, a really typical but um, kind of emblematic project for Make. It was kite aerial photography. Um, there's a there's a CAP KAP f uh, community out there. There's all kinds of rigs you could build. Um, we we designed one, or Chris Benton, who's a professor of architecture at Berkeley, designed one made of popsicle sticks and using a disposable camera, um, and it went off once during a flight. But uh, you know, it was combining something that was pretty fun anyway as a kid to fly kites with uh, photography, and, and it really gives you a perspective that you don't get um, from the ground. This is off on Point Reyes, and I don't know, it's a little hard to see, but if you follow the black string up the kind of the middle of it, um, that's kind of where the, the kite is, and then, you know, Chris is standing on that brown pad in the center there taking the picture. So uh, it began as a, an experience as a, a work project for him, he, as a professor of architecture, he wanted to see buildings from different angles. And he wanted to understand um, kind of how they would look. If you look at a, a building straight down from an airplane, you, you know, you're not seeing uh, those angles. So, and if you look at it from the ground, you're only looking up. So that was his original intent, but he's become actually a photographer uh, a, 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 with a gallery of photos uh, from uh, that he's taken with different rigs. Take it one step further uh, and you begin taking model rocketry that you did as a kid and figuring out you could take a disposable video camera and put it inside of the, the uh, rocket and film your own space flight. Or not quite space flight, but you know what I mean. So, so um, we also see, in, in, and this is one of the issues, of making a radar, radar detector from a Hot Wheels toy. You know, it just, uh, um, how we're taking, the, in fact, we have a lot of consumer technology out there that people are harvesting the, the components from and remaking something else with them. Uh, one of the most popular is actually the Wii controllers, which have a lot of very cheap sensors in them, would be almost as expensive to buy them separately. 
So again, enthusiasts are, are people that are doing something they love doing, they're playing, they're figuring it out, and they're creating a following. And in many ways, that's kind of what we do on Twitter. We, we tell people about what we're doing and, uh, uh, and share uh, uh, links about what other, other projects are going on. Um, we don't always do that. This is a, a tweet a lot project we had where he took a uh, uh, plug an appliance into a, uh, a device called a kilowatt, and then it was modified to have a, a, a wireless uh, capability to upload the data to a computer, which then publishes it to Twitter so that you could, you could actually have a Twitter conversation with your appliance about how much power it's using on a daily basis. So I think when we look out there, we see people building their own networks around what they do. Um, some are creating things, some are consuming things, but they're all sharing things back and forth. And, and I, I think it's kind of interesting to, to you know, as a, as a, at least as a publisher, that's how I think of the, my, my audience is doing this stuff to extend their network. And to some degree, my job is to help them extend that network. Um, to connect them to others and connect them to uh, other communities. And that's really what I, I see we're trying to do at MAKE, is, is, is sort of creating this network of makers, a, a kind of movement where people have um, used the term make, maker to, to mean um, something almost general that allows them to connect to different groups, even though one might be in robotics and the other might be in soft circuit embroidery and another might be in, in uh, uh, you know, uh, fire. Um, uh, machines. So I'm particularly interested, um, and I was going to do a little more on this talk, but it is, it's just, you know, who is following whom in these sort of special interest communities? Um, this is not necessarily make related, but uh, uh, this is, um, you know, Twitter users most followed by people that had, had, had posted during the Web2 Summit. Um, one of our guys in research did this. But I think we're getting to a place where we're starting to get tools through Google's Open Social and others where the activity that people are doing um, in these communities can be uh, 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 sort of understood and um, uh, connected to more easily. I'm in the process of organizing Maker Fair this year, not just in the Bay Area, but in uh, Detroit as well as New York City. And going to a place like Detroit is very different than the Bay Area. It's one of the most depressed regions in the country. Uh, schools are terrible. Um, there's blight, there's all, all kinds of really challenging issues there. But there are lots of creative and technical people there who uh, I think we, we're trying to help network them together to get them to know each other and to uh, allow them uh, re really the freedom to work together uh, and to, to create something new for Detroit. And it's pretty exciting, but it's, you know, I, I think in many ways it's like how do I, uh, what kind of tools can we use to um, make that process more transparent to more people. We know it, makers know where things, where to get supplies, at least in their area. They know where, to, where someone is an expert in something or, or who makes something somewhere. And I have this idea that over time, we'd like to be engaged in mapping some of these communities in terms of where the capabilities are, where the assets are, where the, the makers are in that. And even from a publishing point of view, I mean, publishing talks about, uh, or, or media talks about demographics and psychographics. I think we're going to come up with something close to a term like social graphics, which allows us to understand, you know, that each person that, that we talk to isn't an individual, they're actually a network. They're, they take something, a message like from Twitter, and it might be, oh, it's, uh, uh, sledgehammer fireworks, that's a cool video. I'm going to send that out to my group and uh, I'm, in a sense, feeding my own network with content from, from uh, various sources. So, um, the idea from activity streams and other, other things, how do we connect people in terms of what they're doing? So much who they are, what they want to do and where they want to go. So, all the way to the 20th and 23rd of it, but uh, make, make bring together a lot of very different styles of making, uh, a lot of different kinds of people, um, and I think that makes it different. It's not just geek, it's not just electronics, it's all kinds of different kinds of making, some on the artistic side, some on the, on the deep technology side. 
I'm going to talk about a few of the projects that, that uh, interest me this year that I've seen coming in for Maker Faire. Um, one you is Gigapan, and uh, this was a project from uh, Carnegie Mellon and NASA. They collaborated on how to take uh, uh, high-resolution photographs like panoramas by using a device that uh, uh, basically takes multiple high-res photos and then they stitch them together uh, through software. So it's been focused on uh, panoramas um, creating um, uh, like this top image of the bay and then the, the bottom image there, uh, uh, you know, where you can um, uh, zoom in. But what's kind of interesting and new that I'm uh, seeing is now they're starting to use it for macro photography to take things um, and, and in, in effect enlarge them uh, the, the way um, that they've been doing panoramas. And so I met with uh, this gigamacro.com, um, uh, uh, Gene Cooper, and this is a rig, but what's kind of cool and how this ties together, he's mounted basically his camera on a CNC machine. So it can make very, very small steps to traverse, say, that butterfly and take a, a, a complete picture of it. And to give you a sense of it, and this doesn't, you know, it's like, like uh, doesn't do a great sense of it. But that's a picture of an eagle feather that was taken with this rig. It's composed of 7,500 different pictures that have been stitched together. And again, you, you know, you don't quite get the idea of the resolution from my picture of a picture, but uh, he was in the office last Friday and it was fascinating to see uh, what they're doing there. So uh, again, this is, they're working on it as a kit, as, as something that, uh, um, and, and the kind of transformation that happens is, is they were talking to a natural history museum uh, that if, if someone wants to find a specimen in a natural history museum, you have to make a reservation, you have to fly there and look at it. Um, what if they, they create something like this that creates a very, very high resolution image of that, of that object? Now here, here's another fellow that um, there's a ham radio club. Um, ham is as old as, uh, and, and, you know, it's, it's sort of the, gives birth to the electronics in, in, in many ways. But they are connecting sensors and uh, equipment to measure heart rate and temperature and, communi and communicate, uh, you know, over, over uh, um, frequencies, but, you know, also GPS. And so they're pr they just last weekend did a, or a weekend on the 20th did a flight from 20, a jump from 20,000 feet to produce that map of, you know, here, here's how they, this, this jumper, you know, came down to earth. So um, really pretty interesting. And, and the, but the, apart from just mapping, say, a jump, they're also using it uh, to, you know, potentially to monitor and, and communicate um, uh, between a group of jumpers, uh, which is sometimes a problem in, in their space. Um, and then, you know, I, th I put this in here just because, uh, back to my copying thing, people do simple things that are fun. Um, make a photo booth, uh, and, uh, you know, the equipment is not particularly expensive, but the idea is something that's sort of popular. And so Ray Munson's building a photo booth for Maker Faire, and he wants to create photos like that, that you can go in with your girlfriend or boyfriend and have a picture taken. Um, we also will have bigger things like uh, uh, SOMA, which is the Flaming Lotus Girls um, installation uh, set up at Maker Fair. And, you know, we're not just about new technology. We also cover some of the older stuff. Um, this is an ad created by one of our uh, exhibitors.
So, now, uh, the last thing I'll show you, this is uh, a sensor-activated squirrel cam. And uh, so the idea is it's, um, it was written in the processing language on the Arduino. And, and uh, outside a window is a sensor, and the squirrel trips the sensor, takes the picture. It's uploaded to the website, and it sends its user an email that the squirrel is out there. Uh, the interesting thing is the uh, person that created this application said they, they modified the cat cam project in, in our book by Tom Igo of making things talk, um, modified it instead of um, uh, monitoring a cat, it's monitoring a squirrel. But I was looking on the website, this is an, eight, an eighth grader's project, <laughs> which is pretty impressive work. So um, our theme for this year at Maker Fair is Young Makers, and we've been working uh, with Pixar and the Exploratorium to engage more young kids in making, and uh, we, we had a program last uh, Saturday at the Exploratorium on making music, featured um, several different kinds of people that make musical instruments and everything um, uh, from a, a kelp horn, which was you know, a piece of seaweed taken from the ocean and dried, and, and uh, uh, Chris Bobrowski is a, a French horn player, but she plays the kelp horn, and it's a, it's a beautiful sound. Uh, through uh, 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 Walter Katundu, who, who started off as a DJ, and he began, um, you know, obviously making sounds with a turntable, and then began adding other things, uh, ways of making sound next to the turntable, and began making instruments, and he demonstrated a, a kind of harp uh, that was also connected to his computer, and he was looping us with beautiful sounds. And then uh, G. Wang um, from Stanford, um, is the developer of the Ocarina application, and uh, which is, you know, you blow into the iPhone and um, you play it like a flute. So um, it's just, there's such an interesting mix of technologies here. But part of it is we want to open it up to, uh, you know, we are seeing it open up to kids more and more um, uh, to get kids making things. It's a great way for them, um, you know, to take it, something in the, in the magazine and copy it and try to make it themselves. Um, our next issue, and last, uh, next issue, which comes out in a couple weeks, is called Remote Control Everything. And it's, uh, you know, uh, it actually started because I found some guys, uh, we didn't replicate this in the magazine, but some guys, who were, he, they modified a car so they could drive it with an iPhone. I mean, sit on the roof of the car and, you know, go left, right, <laughs> forward, backward. Um, it's on a test track, as we say. But um, it, it's, it's, it's pretty interesting. So um, this one, uh, you can't see it very well, but it's a lawnmower. Uh, so you can sit in your chair, have your drink, and let the robotic lawnmower mow your lawn. And, um, uh, and that's the kind of thing that's coming up. So, and you also see up there, uh, build this twittering cat toy. So we're still back to cats, and we're still back to pets. Ways to, every time your cat hits the toy, um, uh, sends a, a message to you and lets you know that the cat is active somehow. So um, uh, that's pretty much what I wanted to kind of uh, show you is just sort of some different kinds of projects, different kinds of patterns of making uh, that I'm seeing. And, uh, you know, uh, we'd love to have you uh, make a fair. Uh, also, uh, is our applications are still open. If you have a garage project or something that you're working on, something you'd like to share with other people, uh, anything from a performance piece, an installation piece, an exhibit, a table top full of a electronics and explaining to people. Uh, we'd love to have you there. If you go to makerfair.com, there's the call for makers link um, and fill it out uh, and, and let us know what you'd like to do there. So um, I will uh, thank you very much and be happy to answer any questions you have.